Andreas Krenmeier joins me this week to discuss his new book on Vienna Lager. This is Beersmith Podcast number 219. This is Beersmith Podcast number 219, and it's late July 2020. Andreas Krenmeier joins me this week to discuss his new book on Vienna Lager. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass, with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the new Brew Commander, the new complete brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and propane models. The patent-pending Brew Commander is a high-quality brew house controller with exact precision and the ultimate in flexibility. Whether integrated or freestanding, the Brew Commander offers automated step mashing, boil timers, and amazing advanced settings. Whatever your setup, the Brew Commander offers precision temperature control with perfect repeatability. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander from Blickman Engineering. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith free brewing software a try. I recently released the 3.1 desktop update, which includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, add-ons, and much more. To download your free 21-day trial, go to Beersmith.com today. Again, that's Beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today, my guest is Andreas Krenmeier. He joins me to discuss his new book on Vienna Lager. Andreas is a software developer, home brewer, and amateur beer historian who lives in Berlin, Germany. Originally from Austria, his focus is German and Austrian beer styles. Andreas, it's great to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I am excellent. It's a beautiful day here in Clifton, Virginia. Uh, how are things in Berlin? Uh, sl- slightly rainy, but um, the, uh, other than that, it's it's good. Well, we got a good connection, and I appreciate you joining me today from Berlin. Um, I understand, though, that you actually grew up in Austria. Is that right? That's that's right. Um, I was born and raised in Austria, and in 2009, I, I moved to Berlin um, due to my job as software developer. Have been living in in Berlin since then. So if we dive into your beer history, I understand that you grew up sampling a lot of Austrian beers, but some German beers as well, right? Yeah, you could say so. So how did that uh, turn into an interest in in historical beers? Uh, I, I would say, like, the, when when I when I grew up uh, drinking beers so or legal drinking age uh, at, in Austria is uh, sixteen. Um, and I started drinking it at that age. Um, be- beer was really like I would say fairly monotonous. Um, it's mostly pale lagers, um, the occasional Bavarian wheat beer. Um, so it's 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 it has not been sophisticated at that at that time. So uh, similar um, similar perhaps to the U.S. where uh, you know before I don't know before the '90s basically all we had was was very light lagers pretty much. It, it's pretty much it's pretty much that um, think, thinking back uh, the main style that was by far the most common is, is Austrian Merzen. Um, so it, it sounds like the like the Bavarian Merzen that that um, the Amber the, the Oktoberfest beer know. right yeah but the Austrian one is actually um, it's kind of like a, a like Bavarian Helles but a little bit more bitterness um, it's 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 really hard to describe because it doesn't fit into into a, any like typical beers how you would find in in, in like uh, beer style guidelines. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that's that's by far the most the most common beer. Um, and I when when I when I met my my wife in in 2011, uh, so she's from the UK. Uh, she introduced me into a whole new perspective of beer uh, with with uh, the whole like uh, British cask ale um and like pop culture um and then around the same time there was also this this craft beer boom in berlin as, as one of the first places in in germany and so we we started looking into home brewing 
Um, and we basically brewed all the styles that we were interested in, but we that we couldn't get. Um, and at the same time, like, I've, I've, I've always been quite interested in history. Um, where, I'm, where I'm from in Austria, you know, you, you're very much surrounded by it. Um, like where, where I, where I'm, where I'm from specifically from, from Linz by the, by the river Danube. Like there's, there's about 2000 years of continuous settlement history. Um, so, you, you know, you, you always run into something historic, some, some artifact, some historic building. So, I mean, um, are you, are you a, Amer- are you a closet historian as well? Are you interested in just history in general? I, I actually read a tremendous amount of history. It's, it's just a general, um, interest. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really focusing on anything, but I, 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 w- I would say I generally like reading about it, learning more about it, uh, you know, and understanding more of like the, 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 the wider context. Um, that, I mean, mm-hmm. that, that's, that's, that's just a, a, a fun thing. And so, so, so how'd you get into Vienna lagers or Vienna history, uh, Brianna beers specifically? Cause uh, as you mentioned, I guess the modern, most mm-hmm. of the modern examples are pretty, pretty uniform, right? Mm. Uh, so the, the the thing was when when we started homebrewing, I, I simply started looking into like historic beer books and what was around. I found some some English language books um, from like the late 18th, early 19th centuries, uh, uh, and I just kept reading and I recognized a lot of stuff that I knew from from homebrewing. Um, and then I just went on like, what German language uh, literature is there? Um, since that's my my native language, um, and I, I just kept looking, found like huge amounts of of like historic beer styles that were around. A lot of them aren't around anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually published um, a book uh, about that um, a few years ago, and then it I, I think I think it started five years ago when when I, when I was specifically interested in Vienna Lager because I'd I'd read about it in the context of craft beer. Um, but I didn't know the style, like it, w- it was not a thing that you could get in Austria, um, at, at, at the time. Um, and so I just started reading and studying, starting to look into, into historic sources and just picked up a few bits and pieces, um, just wrote it in my, in my blog, whatever I could find out because I wanted to get to the, to the bottom of the, of the whole thing, like what, what was Vienna Lager originally like? Um, and then about one and a half years ago, um, uh, uh, friends of mine basically nudged me and said, hey, you blocked actually quite a bit about Vienna Lager. Do you think you could write a whole book about it? Um, and I said, I can, I can try. Um, and I, I just kept looking into the whole topic more and more closely. Um, and, and I found a lot of like interesting and surprising stuff that um, really wasn't part of the uh, narrative about Vienna Lager so far um, that is not that well known or that, that even I would say is um, counter to what people commonly think about Vienna Lager. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously you published it in a book, which I think is available on Amazon, right? Uh, that's, that's right. Um, so it's called think- Vienna Lager. Um, it's simply called Vienna Lager. Very easy to find. Yeah. Um, and it was it was also the, the easiest way for me to, to publish it because I um, didn't have to go through for any any um, like big publisher or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but just go the self publishing route, which I think is a is a, um, a great way of uh, yeah like publishing special interests about special interest topics nowadays. Well, I mean, unlike some beers, uh, Vienna Lager does have a definite origin to it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the origin of it? And I, I, the, specifically, I think you're talking in the book about the man who invented it, right? Yeah. So uh, the, the beer style very much goes back to what Anton Drea has been doing. Um, Anton Drea is a, 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 a Austrian brewer um, who was active in the, in the um, 19th century. But to like specifically understand the origin of the beer style, we should look at like the very specific path Anton Drea went as a as a brewer. So he he grew up in a in a family that that was very much rooted in brewing. So his his father um, was originally from from Swabia, which is nowadays um, southwest Germany, um, and he, he he moved to um, to Austria 
Um, he was actually going to move like further down the river there, but he, he stopped in Austria for whatever reason, started working um, as a, a first as a, as a waiter and salaman, and then had enough money um, to rent a brew house. Uh, it was reasonably successful, like didn't get super rich, um, but with with the earnings from, from the first rented brew house, he was able to buy another one and then bought um, a, a, a second one. And I think he's, he sold the first one. And the, 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 the final brew house was the brewery Klein Schwechert, which was just outside of Vienna. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that, that was his, his brewery then. Um, Anton Andreas' father died relatively young, though, when, when Anton was, was just 10 years um, old. Um, and Anton... So that the, uh, Anton's mother uh, took over the brewery, and I think she rented it out to someone else in the family. Um, and Anton, just as a as a boy, went through this this very classic humanist secondary education in a Viennese boarding school, um, and then did an apprenticeship at, at another brewery um, in another suburb of, of Vienna called Simmering. Um, at, at that time. Brewing in the whole Vienna area was still top fermenting with, with very few exceptions. Mm-hmm. And um, I think what's, what's important to, to, to know, know here is also that beer was not a massively popular drink. Like wine and uh, an Austrian kind of apple cider called Most um, were, were actually more popular. Um, and the beer that was consumed in and around in Vienna um, was sometimes like imported from from more western parts of Austria or even Bavaria, so the the, the local beer did not have a good reputation. Hmm. And so, in during during this apprenticeship uh, at the Simmering Brewery, Anton Dreher met Gabriel Sedelmeier, um, who was the son of the then owner of the Spaten Brewery in Munich, um, who was simply he was on a trip through Austria um, to to study breweries and distilleries. Um, and they, they, they got along really well. They, they, like, apparently their, their initial meeting was just a few days. Um, um, but they, they got along really well and they stayed in touch and they, they came up with a plan. Yeah. We want to learn about English brewing and we want to go to, to England and look at uh, the hop gardens in Kent and all these things. And so they, they planned a trip. And then in 1833, um, they, they traveled to London, um, Gabriel Siedlmeier took two more friends um, with him. Uh, one was was uh, Georg Lederer from from Nuremberg, another um, like rather rather well known um, Bavarian brewing family, and and a fourth guy um, of whom I've only been able to find out the the surname called Neindl, um, who was also from from Austria, um, and they they came to London, um, rented a flat tried to tour some breweries, but none of them would really let them in. Um, so that was a, that was a problem because uh, Bavarian breweries um, or breweries like in, in, in Austria and Germany at that time were, were a lot more open um, to people from the industry. Um, and so they had to find a way in. And so Anton simply took a job at, at Barclay Perkins um, just to learn about the brewing process. He was apparently just um, employed for a very brief period of time. And he did it only, only to to get a better overview over the whole brewing process there. Um, then, by by pure chance, they they met the brewing scientist um, called David Booth. They it, it was actually um, Anton Andrea had had bought a book, um, and in that book there was a, a an ad to uh, to to with 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 an address in uh, in in London, and it said you could you could buy like brewing equipment, like small you know, sacrometers and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. You could buy there. So they, they went there um, and um, they, they uh, got along really well. They, they had a, they had good like, um, uh, dis- discussions about, about brewing science or the state of the art of brewing science at, at that time. Um, David Booth taught them a few things. He taught them about what, what attenuation is and how to actually use a sacrometer, um, which, which was quite a new thing um, for for them and was was not a not a common tool for brewers uh, in in Germany at all. Um, they they also got some letters of reference um, from from David Booth, so it was easier then for for them to get into breweries. And so they they started approaching 
this 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 whole thing of of looking at breweries and how they're brewing more systematically and they had the, the idea of stealing samples of of wort and and fermenting beer um and they 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 never really felt good about it so they they, they tried to they they always felt like okay if, if they get caught they might get beaten up uh and and <laughs> thrown out on the street or something so they 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 got a they got a special walking stick with a with a um valve underneath so they could secretly take samples just just put it in a fermenter take a sample then um of course they, they, they probably didn't know it at the time but they were stealing the yeast as well right yeah they, they <laughs> probably didn't didn't know so much about or they, they probably didn't care so much about that but I, I, from what i could gather they they very much did things like measuring um uh, specific gravities on on, on samples <laughs> um that's that's what they apparently did, and they also had like small thermometers that they held into um, uh, fermenters and, and things like that. Um, so they, they they created this this whole system of, um, of of stealing samples and basically industrial espionage. Um, and after some some time, they they went to Scotland. Um, in they went to Edinburgh, and there they met um, a, a brewer called John Moyer and. He actually gave them fairly open access to his uh, brewery, so they they could take lots of notes, um, look at the brewing process more and more in detail, and they they actually learned a lot from that. And then New Year's Eve, um, uh, eighteen thirty-three, they they traveled back. Um, Gabriel Tillemaier he stayed back in France a bit more and took a bit of a longer route, um, and Anton Drea went straight to Munich. Uh, specifically saying, I want to, I want to use our our stealing system also in Munich. Um, <laughs> and then they spent the winter there um, to to basically do experiments. Um, what what they had learned from from their journey, and the the biggest things they've they've learned um, were were definitely British malting techniques. So the, um, um, apparently, a slow sprouting and and germination at low temperatures was was something that was very specific in British malting and. Where they were, where British monsters were very um, particular about. Um, the other thing was was smoke rekilning, which was something um, that was the, the state of the art in in the UK back then. Yeah, I mean this was this was pretty early on, right? You said you mentioned eighteen yeah. thirty ish. Uh, they were just mm-hmm. making the transition. A lot of monsters were making the transition from uh, uh, smoke, basically smoked malt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> To, to coke-fired malt or coke-dried malt, mm. which was much lighter in character. So, mm. Yeah, and uh, whereas in, in, in Germany and Austria, um, the vast majorities of malt, malsters, brewers and malsters, really, um, were, were still on smoke kilns. Um, and so the, the, um, one, of, one of the big innovations were, the, were the, as they were called in Germany, the English malt kilns, uh, that were, they were smoke-free. Um, uh, they they called them English smoke kilns, but that was that was basically just an um, allusion to um, basically the, the 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 high quality and the and the um, smokeless nature of of British malt, uh, which un- until I would I would say 1830s 1840s um, was 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 uh, not very common in, in in Germany at all for for kiln malt. Um, so how how did all this all this uh, knowledge eventually evolve into uh, a lager fermentation and also specifically the Vienna lager style? Um, it it basically um, it, it basic or how should I say um, Anton Dreyer he, ba- he basically came back he had all these ideas what he wanted to do um, and he specifically said I want to I want to improve the malt that we're making um, and so he he. Uh, in, in, installed a smoke-free kiln um, to to produce a, a fairly pale malt. Um, that, that was that was one thing. Um, the other thing was he um, he wanted to to do um, Bavarian uh, Bavarian style decoction mashing because he he thought that was like the the the, the highest form of of uh, mashing. Um, so and, sort of a maybe a double decoction or something like that. Even, even triple decoction. Triple like decoction. The Bavarian, Bavarian decoction mashing at that time was was all about triple decoctions, um, very very specifically, um, and so 
he, he had these these two elements and then um he he initially uh also uh, uh what or sorry i'm I'll, I'll start again that's okay mm. uh he initially um brewed beer um with with the the uh, pale uh, smoke free malt um and the, and the decoction mashing um but he still used top fermenting yeasts um but he then sent the letter to to um his friend Gabriel Silmeyer could you send me a, a sample of your bottom fermenting yeasts and um already in, in like uh, late 1836 or early 1837 um i couldn't pinpoint it closer um he started brewing bottom fermented beer um wow that, he, yeah that is very early for lager he did not do any lagering though um yeah. and 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 that's that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting detail but he 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 had no he had no lagering space um so he had to send it out right after um primary fermentation out to the pub sellers and basically leave it to the pub owner um, to hopefully mature it for long enough, um, but it, it was it was quite a success. Um, so there there's there's a letter um, that uh, Anton Drea sent to, to Gabriel Tillmeier in March 1837, where he specifically says, "I owe the rapid growth of my business." Sorry, I owe the rapid growth of my business in recent times to my bottom fermented beers, and that was, that was March 1837, and that was. Probably just a fairly low alcohol beer, so we're, we're talking probably three and a half percent at most. Um, so and what, during, during, so I, I just wonder when did he actually produce something we would call a Vienna Lager? I guess pretty close in 1837, right? Um, the 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 time where he most definitely did it um, was 1840, mm-hmm. um, because 1840 was was the time where um, one of his neighbors um, offered to rent his, his wine cellar. So Treya took the opportunity and, and used that wine cellar to, to lager his beer. So he had, he had control over it and he produced it at a, at a strength um, that was, um, that was um, like what we would say was a proper lager back, uh, back then. Um, and at 1840... Um, with with the with the first seller that he had, that was also the, the the point in time where he completely stopped brewing any any top fermented beers. So un, until then, from 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 37 until um, like from 1837 till 1840, during the summer he was still brewing his his top fermented beers, and only during the winter doing doing the the bottom fermented beers. Uh, but now with with the seller, um, uh, he could he had a bit more space. Um, and and uh, really could keep the beer to to his own quality standards. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 1841, 1842, he really started investing and in, started building huge lagering spaces that that were that were uh, much much bigger and could hold much more beer. And the business was absolutely booming. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned the Bavarian uh, techniques obviously influenced the development of Vienna Lager. How did Vienna Lager influence uh, development of Czech lagers and also German styles? Um, with with the with the Czech lagers, um, I, w- I would say the the, the influence is, is a more subtle one. What definitely was it was a was a huge influence is um, the, the the business success of, of Anton Dreyer. Like his his brewing business grew like crazy, and and made bottom fermented beers really popular in Vienna um, and and in in more parts of Austria. Um, at that time, some Czech brewers were already brewing bottom fermented beers. So the the the, the thing is, there's, there's there had always been some bottom fermenting going on in 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 Bohemia. Um, but really only from the 1830s, 1840s um, on more breweries tried to pick it up. Like one, like an, an, another very, very famous example is, is um, uh, the Burger Brauerei in, in Pilsen, which we now know as Pilsen Urquell. They hired um, a, a Bavarian brewer um, who then started a bottom fermentation um, with, a, with a, a very pale malt, 
um, and basically started the, the whole pills in a beer style. Um, but this this uh, industrial industrialization of of uh, of beer brewing that, that Anton Drea started, particularly lager production, it, right? Yeah, I mean. to- totally kicked it off. And um, from the 1850s to the 1870s, Bohemia pretty much completely switched to to um, bottom ferment bottom fermentation um, exclusively. So and, I would say that's that's one influence. Um, and then you mentioned Marzen, I think, was another style influenced, right? Oh yeah, um, there the connection is like super clear, um, and we have it really well documented. So a bit of a background to that: Merzen used to be like Merzen in Munich specifically used to be the name for a lager beer that was usually enjoyed in the summer. Um, up to the end of the 18th century, and it was it was there was a very association with a, with a very particular kind of um, uh, brewing organizational system. Um, there, I haven't found a, a, good, a good English name. I, I just came up with with turn brewing because it was a a, um, a brewing system where where brewers were brewing in in turns. Um, so that it was it was very anti competitive, and um, the, they had a lottery system in place to determine. Basically, who was who was brewing next? So that that system, or that's where the the Merzen beer term comes from in Munich or in Bavaria. But that system was um, abolished in the in the uh, late 18th century, um, and and was was quite quite quickly forgotten. But in 1870, um, a, a, a son of, of Somebody else from the Sedelmeyer family. So the Sedelmeyer family, they they um, in total owned two breweries. One was was Spaten, as I mentioned earlier. The the other one was actually the older brother of um, of, of Gabriel Sedelmeyer. He he owned the uh, Franciscana uh, brewery. Um, I think also quite quite well known uh, brewery nowadays. Um, and his son, he had done an apprenticeship in Anton Dreas brewery. Um, and came back and wanted to brew something like a Vienna lager, but a bit stronger. You you could say it, it's it's kind of like a Vienna lager, but more as a as a Bock beer. So it, it it had the original gravity around roundabout of a, of a Bock beer back in the day. Um, and he brewed that in 1870. Then in 1871 he brewed it again. Um, and at that time there, there there was an unusually hot summer, and one of the um, stall owners um, for Oktoberfest. He approached the, the, the brewery um, and said, I, I would like to have some beer um, for Oktoberfest. Um, we're, we're running out of a regular beer that we would be serving. I don't want to serve any like young beer, like young and weak beer that would be brewed for the, for the winter. Um, and by, by pure chance, um, Franciscana Brewery, they, they had this... Um, this this Vienna style lager or or kind of bock beer, um, uh, uh, still still lagering. Um, so they sampled it, and uh, Schottenhammer, the 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 stall owner, um, said, "Yeah, this this is a great beer. I wanna I wanna serve this this as Oktoberfest." And he he simply picked the name Merzen and reused that term, um, and the beer became really popular, <laughs> um, and it it, it became really like over over the years that a special beer type just just for the for the Oktoberfest. Um yeah. No, it's and, amazing. I, I've been to Oktoberfest and it's a, it's an mm-hmm. amazing beer and great great to have in the fall. You know? mm-hmm. I, I have to admit I haven't I haven't been yet, but I've um I've I've been to, to other few festivals um in the in the general region. Um it's it's it, it's just a just just a great kind of event and fun. Um, a lot of fun. And yeah. and and Merzen really like has has the status of a of a like a real fest beer like a, a beer just for the particular festival that that you're that you're going to. Absolutely. Um, and then in your book, you also mentioned that Vienna jumped across the uh, Atlantic and ended up in mm-hmm. uh, the U.S. and in Mexico, influencing a lot of beers here, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and and. That, that was actually something um, when I did my research. I was I was very surprised um, about when I when I uh, looked into it more more closely because um, the the main association that people have with Vienna Lager 
is is, is Mexico, and that's that's what you normally find. But when you, when you look into um, the the whole um, the whole literature, um, you you actually find a very strong connection of um, Vienna Lager and the United States, like from the 1870s on um, German Americans, um, German American brewers uh, um, were brewing that, that, that kind of beer style. It was, it was fairly popular. It was not the most popular beer, um, but it was, it was still fairly popular. And um, you can, you can find really lots of newspaper ads um, just for Vienna lager or Vienna beer or Wiener beer um, um, or, or uh, similar names. And it was when when you look at the at the at the brewing literature of that time, um, which was often written by by German Americans and, and often published, like in both in German and English, um, you, you you often find um, like v- Vienna Lager as, as one of the like three model beer types besides the Munich Dark Lager and the, and the Pilsner, and the, at that time American Lager as a distinct type, I would say still emerged. Um, when 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 German brewers were still you know getting accustomed to really high protein um, six row barley malt and using them together with with uh, adjuncts like corn or rice, um, and because because the, you know the, the differences between between beer styles were were not so clear back then, and so there there are some sources that say yeah American lagers are kind of like Vienna lagers. But more highly attenuated, like drier and maybe a bit more bitter. Um, but it, it it shows the 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 general understanding of what what is a Vienna Lager, what is typical for a Vienna Lager, very much must have been there and must have been a, a common thing. If you you know if you can if you can use Vienna Lager as a, as a reference point to describe other beers. Um, and it's it's a it's a beer style that that really um, uh, kept kept on being brewed. Um, I, w- I would say up up to up to the prohibition and and after prohibition you can still find it in some brewing literature, only occasionally as as a product. Um, what I found most interesting, apparently Coors um, had a golden export lager, which they described as like a Viennese type of beer, and they they only stopped brewing it in 1950. Hmm. Um, and then in the in the 1970s, um, like the, the early homebrewers picked up the the, the um, that the beer style again, um, and and Michael Jackson like briefly wrote about it. And um, I would say that's that's what made it part of, of this like canon of classic beer styles um, that that we know nowadays. Mm. Um, where, whereas with with Mexico, um, it that country was actually quite quite late in picking up uh, 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 lager brewing, um, and they they just had their unique challenges. First of all, the local population didn't really drink much beer. Um, most of the beer drinkers were were like rich European immigrants or or, or um, expats, um, and so the, the the few brewers that that started brewing, um, they 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 had to struggle with with the, with the high temperatures. So. Um, for for a very long time, bottom fermentation was completely out of the question. Mm. Many brewers just used local barley, which they malted themselves and dried in the sun. They didn't even use kilns. They they used cane sugar as a as a brewing sugar. Um, so it, it was it was it was not great. Um, it was it was not great conditions uh, to 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 work with. But they develop eventually developed their own style. Um, one of the things I was interested in, you, you did an extensive study of historic recipes. Um, how were some of the uh, modern Vienna lagers that we enjoy today different from the historical examples that you researched and, and detailed mm. in the book? Mm. Uh, I, I would say, or m- maybe first of all, one, one thing, one, one big problem was um, that I was not able to find like a complete, concise recipe that traces back to the to the Kleinschwechata brewery. Um, the, the problem there is um, and and Jeff Jeff Allworth found found that out um, on a on a trip to uh, to Vienna last year that um, e- even the brewery there they, they don't have any old brewing records anymore. So it's 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 just a reconstruction. But um, 
the the reconstruction of this of this historic recipe is, is quite clear. It's 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 super simple in the ingredients. It's just one type of malt and one one type of hops, um, but it's very process driven. It's 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 a it's a smash beer, um, single malt, single hops, but rather sophisticated uh, triple decoction mashing. Well, of course, the, the malts probably weren't as highly modified and the ingredients weren't mm-hmm. quite at the same quality as we have today, mm-hmm. I would imagine, right? Mm-hmm. Apparently, the, um, apparently the, the, the barley, um, the specific barley variety, uh, very, very common and popular um, at that time, was considered to be of, of, of a fairly good quality, um, which was called Hanna, which uh, is, is from uh, Moravia, which is a, 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 nowadays another part of the, of the Czech Republic. Mm-hmm. Um, it was probably very good for that time, um, and it was it was one one of the you know r- really well known names like how how you would say Mary's Otter nowadays or, or Chevalier was was probably the, the of uh, equivalent quality um, in in the UK, um, but it it still formed a basis for, um, for 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 newer varieties that that were bred. So I, I would say that there's there's definitely a, a big um, uh, or there have been definitely big steps forward um, to produce even even better suited barley varieties. Hmm. Um, well, we don't have too much time left, but I was hoping we could hmm. maybe walk us through a simple Vienna lager recipe, what it looks like, what yeast you use, uh, typical hops, and so on, uh, hmm. for the homebrewers out there that are interested in, in producing this hmm. particular style. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I would say, um, like, for, for, for a super traditional Vienna lager, just just go with a 100% Vienna malt. Um, that's that's what the what the brewery originally used. They they also brewed it like a lower strength draft beer where they added a little bit of roasted malt, um, just just a tiny tiny amount. Um, but they 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 kept it simple. They they produced their own malt um, exactly for their purpose, um, and that's that's what they stuck to. For for a more modern version, I would say you know it's it's up to the brewer's preference. Um, I, I still prefer a large amount of, of um, Vienna malt as a, as a base malt just just for the for the um, overall overall flavor um, but like pe- people are free to free, free to do as they like mm-hmm. um, and the, and the hops uh, you, you mentioned uh, grain bills 100 percent right yeah uh, so for, for, for hops um, I would go with with salt hops it's it's the main variety. Um, that Anton Drea used. Um, he, in the in the uh, late 1850s, um, bought a, a brewery in in Bohemia that that is in the in the Saats region, um, where he n- basically next to the brewery had his own hop garden and and grew quite a significant amount of hops. Um, so Saats, Saats hops are are definitely um, the, the the right choice. I would say for, for if you wanted to go for a more modern interpretation, any any kind of noble hop character is 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 still fairly traditional. So, so of course, Saats, but like Hallertau, Mittelfrüh, Spalter, Tetnanger. Mm-hmm. I think it's also if you want to experiment more, um, there are now these these all these all these modern varieties that are basically bred as modern successors of of, of old um, hop varieties, like with names like Saphir, Perle, Smaragd, Opal, Diamant. I haven't, I haven't, I have to say, I haven't tried any of, of them, but um, I've read great things, and I, I think there's there's a lot of space to to experiment with with new hop varieties. And your preference for yeast? Um, f- for yeast, j- just like for the for the historic version, you want the low attenuating one to to get the right attenuation, um, which makes the beer. I would say fairly sweet, which can make it make it unusual or unexpected. Um, but for for a more modern approach, and that's how I also prefer them, is is just a, a, a W thirty four seventy, for example, um, mm-hmm. just just to, to dry the beer out enough um, um, to to make it not cloying. Um, and and I mean that there aren't personally, I don't see that many differences in in different different um yeast um yeast strains so but just go with with whatever you prefer and then do you do any special mash techniques do you actually go through a decoction have you tried that 
I personally do all my lager brewing with with decoction. Um, I do not do the whole triple decoction because I have uh, I, I noticed that with with the normal triple decoction, the protein rests are way too long, and I never ever got good foam stability. Um, so I'm 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 doing a, a compromise where I'm where I'm doing a double decoction where initially I take a very large decoction of, of two thirds of, of the whole mesh. And the first decoction I, I heat up to, to 70 degrees, which oh God, I don't know how much uh, that is in Fahrenheit. So 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 basically just for, for, it. A se- yeah, for for a sacrification, just just briefly for 15 minutes, then bringing it to a boil and then mixing it back. And that brings it into um, an area of, of 65 degrees Celsius. So I'm wrote that on this 149 Fahrenheit um, mm-hmm. and it, it skips the protein rest um, or basically limits it just to the, to the very brief period of, of heating up the first decoction and then just do the second decoction. Um, that has worked really well. I think it, it brings in a lot of uh, decoction character because it, it's quite an intense first boil, um, but it does not cause any, or at least to me, it has not caused any, any foam stability issues. Um, but for if, if, if you it at, your, at home, I would say um, a normal multi-step infusion mesh is perfectly fine. Like something like Hochkurz or so that doesn't do too much protein rest. Um, if, 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 you, if, you, if you're lazy, single-step infusion mesh is probably probably fine as well. Um, mm-hmm. And then fermentation, do you do anything special during fermentation for it? I, I simply pitch, like personally, I, I pitch a large amount, a healthy dose of, of yeast at 10 degrees Celsius and just let it ride. Mm-hmm. And then when fermentation is finished, I simply reduce the temperature. The, uh, what, I, what I said with, with the low attenuating yeasts, how they historically were, were used, um, they um, had them fermenting at extremely low temperatures um, and, and uh, then lagered them for months and months at just a few degrees above freezing. But it's it's um, it's it's a just a slightly different variety of, of yeast that not nowadays practically doesn't make so much more sense. And I, I talked to um to, to somebody from a from a yeast lab and they said, yeah, the, these these they're called Sarza type yeasts. Um, they are they're they're, uh, they're they're great when it comes to to working at cold temperatures. Uh, they're they're they're, uh, they're 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 quite. Uh, they're, they're just working really well at cold temperatures, um, but they produce a lot of diacetyl, mm. and they're they're not practical in in modern breweries at all, and that's that's why nobody uses them anymore. So, any final tips for somebody looking to brew the perfect Vienna Lager? I, I'm 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 not sure there is a a, a, a perfect Vienna Lager. Um, <laughs> I, I I personally prefer a, a, a fairly traditional one. Um, that is that is uh, basically just Vienna malt and Sartz hops um, to to a, a fairly normal strength. I like it. A, I like it a bit more on the on the bitter side. So I've I've, I've brewed one with with uh, 40 IBU um, and that has worked um, surprisingly well. Hmm. Um, but I would say it's it's a uh, it's it's something where you can experiment. Um, as I, or, earlier I already said, you can try different hop varieties. Um, it's it's something if if you use small amounts. Like certain certain special modes can probably bring in a bit of bit of extra complexity. Um, I just wouldn't overdo it. Um, but it, there, there, there's, there's a lot you can you can you can play with. And Andreas, before we go, I wanted to uh, mention your blog. Could you uh, perhaps share the address for your blog as well as uh, where to find the new book? Um, okay, my my blog is called DaftEgypt.com. I probably need to um, oh, spell that out. Um, I, I need to uh, spell that out. That's D A F T W E J I T dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's basically um, well, but my wife's from from Northern Ireland, and uh, it, like it was the kind of an endearing term of a you know the, a, of 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 a of a stupid idiot, but in a in a, in a friendly kind of way, and she she started calling me that at some point. And so I, I simply took that as a, as a name for my blog. Um, and my, my book, I mean, I can show it here to the camera. Ah, nice. That's what it looks like. Um, you can just get that on, on Amazon worldwide. Um, just search for the title Vienna Lager. I think it comes on, uh, up as, as the first hit. Um, it's, it's available as, as an ebook, um, and as, as printed book, um, 
I, I think I think I'm selling it for a moderate price. I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm not in it to make lots and lots of money with with that book. Um, yeah, can retire to, in the Bahamas. Uh... So, so there, there there is not much money to be made with with beer literature. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the word out, and I'm I think as you could you could hear, I'm enthusiastic about Vienna Lager, and I'm I'm trying trying to get. Um, my enthusiasm to 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 everyone, um, and that was one of the reasons why why I wrote that book. Well, Andreas, I I uh, wish you great success with your book, and and appreciate thank you, you coming on the show. I'm always interested in historical brewing, mm-hmm. um, so thank you again. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. And again, my guest today was uh, Andreas Krenmeier, author of the new book Vienna Lager. Uh, great having you. Thanks again. Thank you. A big thank you to Andreas Krenmeier for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Brew Commander, the new complete brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. The patent pending Brew Commander is a digital brew house controller with high precision and the ultimate in flexibility. The Brew Commander offers automated step mashing, boil timers, and advanced brew day settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander from Blickman Engineering. To order your today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. I've recently released the new Beersmith 3.1 desktop update, which includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, and much more. To download a free 21-day trial version, go to beersmith.com today. Again, that's beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. (music) 